Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 15. Today, we're talking about Guraud shading. I don't know if that's how you actually pronounce it, but that's the way I'm gonna go, so you better just get used to it. Now, you might be wondering, Chili, what the hell is Guraud shading anyways? Well, it's a way of smooth shading your shit. Uh, up until now, we've been doing flat shading, but if you know, notice in games, shit ain't so flat and faceted. It's nice and smooth and round. So we're going to be learning a technique how to do that. Now, if we're going to be smooth shading some stuff, we would like to have some smooth stuff to shave. And a sphere is about the smoothest thing that I can think of. So we want a sphere. Now, we could just load a sphere from an object file. Uh, but sphere is a fairly simple piece of geometry. We could also generate it procedurally, and that would have the advantage of us being able to, you know, control some things about it, specifically the mesh density. Now, the way we're going to generate it, there's a bunch of ways you can do it, but the way we're going to do it is basically a latitude, longitude type model. So if we look, you got your latitudes, they're separated by angles, these lines here, and then longitudes and the intersection of those, you've got nice vertices. And we can translate this into a 3D model, and these vertices will be the vertices of the mesh, and the faces will be what these you know squares look like. And the top and the bottom, you just uh, you put one vertex at the top and the bottom, those are the poles, and you connect these guys there. So you, know, and you don't have quads, you just have single triangles connecting there. Fairly straightforward, not that difficult to conceptualize. Other ways of doing it are uh, ico icosphere. Icosphere is like this. It has the advantage of every triangle being the same size, which is not what you get with these guys. You get skinny triangles up here, fat guys down here. But this is simpler, and this is what we're going to go with. So the general idea is you've got a vector, point it straight up into the Z direction, and then you've got one loop that rotates that vector by, you know, whatever degrees are of separation between your lines of latitude. And then for every one of those... Uh, lines of latitude, you've got another loop that is going to be rotating it in the longitude direction, and for every iteration of that inner loop, you're going to generate a, uh, a vertex. Then once you've generated all your vertices, then you're going to uh, generate indices to, you know, select vertices and map out triangles for drawing. Then you've got your model. The way we're going to do it is we're going to do, we're going to skip the North Pole and the South Pole, we're going to generate all the vertices besides those. Then we're going to generate all the indices going around here, except for the ones that, uh, the, the, the one band here that connects the, the end to the start. So we're going to do no capping, no wrapping. You'll see, you'll see when, I, uh, when I run the program. So, here we go. How do we start? Well, we've got our base vertex. That's just the one that is... Uh, pointing up in the Z direction, there you go, by radius. Uh, our function here, sphere get the index triangle list, you give it a radius, you give it the number of latitude divisions, you give it the number of longitude divisions. So you get your base vertex or your base vector, and then you get the, uh, the angle between latitudes, and that's just pi divided by the latitude divisions. Remember, latitude is half circle, so it's pi divided by divisions. Longitude is full circle, so it is 2 pi divided by longitude divisions. We create our vector to hold the vertices. We're going to loop through latitude. We're going to start at 1 because we want to skip the north pole. And we're going to go through number divisions. And we rotate the base vector by uh, the latitude angle times our current latitude index, and that will get us a uh, latitude base. So there's our base vector, and if we are on latitude uh, 0, 1, 2, we would rotate it from here down to here in the x-axis. If this is the z-axis, this is the, uh, I guess this is the x-axis for our purposes, and this would be the y-axis. It's kind of weird, but you get the you get the friggin' idea, right? So, rotate it around the x-axis to here. And then once we get this base vector, we're going to be rotating it around z. So you'll see that in the inner loop. In the inner loop, we run from, you know, 0 to longitude divisions. We, we put a vertex into the list. 
and then we want to set its position to the base latitude rotated around Z by the longitude angle uh, divide times the the current longitude index and then there you go you've got one vertex you do that for all the vertices except for the North Pole and the South Pole now to calculate the indices uh, we're gonna loop through our latitudes and our longitudes and uh, there's a little uh, what what would you call it? a little lambda function here to uh, to get the index in the vector vertices based on the index, the latitude, and the index, the longitude. I use that, and I'm just going so i latitude, i longitude. Let's let's do a little diagram show you how that works. All right, so let's say our latitudes are indexed like this: zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and our longitudes are indexed zero, one, two, three. And so let's say our i latitude is at one. So starting here, and our i longitude is at uh, zero. We would go from here, i latitude, i longitude. Then we have i latitude, i longitude plus one, i latitude plus one, i longitude, and i latitude plus one, i longitude plus one. These are the four that we are interested in, and then we will just be selecting, you know, three of them. These three to create one triangle, and these three to create another triangle. Being mindful of winding order. And we just keep doing that. And that's all this code is doing here. Right, I latitude I long plus one. Here's plus one, and then plus one plus one. Push all those back into our indices. Uh, here's where we're going to want to put the wrapping because we've got to wrap around from the last longitude to the first longitude uh, vertices. And but we're not wrapping, we haven't put the caps on yet. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. So this is what the sphere looks like without any wrapping or capping. It's generally how I like to operate is do a simple version of something, you know, eliminating things like special uh, special cases. And once I get the baseline down, then I can work on the other bullshit. It's baby steps as small as possible. So we've got the baseline down. All that's left is we add the uh, the wrapping and the capping. So the cap vertices is very simple. It's just the uh, the base vector and then the negative of that vector will give us the North Pole and the South Pole. And I'm just putting those at the end of the list of vertices. And I'm also remembering the index I North Pole, I South Pole, because it'll be useful later on. Then down here for the wrapping, we're just going to wrap around. So I latitude and then number of longitude divisions minus one and so that's the end and then here we got zero those are the beginnings so this is the general idea of wrapping around longitude the last longitude connects to the first longitude zero and there you go you've got your wrapping band now for the cap fans all we've got to do is loop through all of the longitudes uh, at the first latitude and at the last latitude. And we're connecting all those to the North Pole and the South Pole. So here, instead of having six indices, we only have three because we're only doing a single triangle uh, per face, basically. And then wrap triangles. You also have to wrap around for the uh, North Pole and the South Pole, and that's done here, special cases. And then there you go. You have got your M effing full sphere. Let's take a look. So this is what that mf -er looks like. Nice sphere. Very nice. Very, uh, very, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Faceted, pointy, blocky. It's very flat shaded, but it looks pretty cool. Hope you'll agree. Uh, now, to make this, I mean, in games, you sometimes you see this aesthetic, but usually spheres and round things are smoother shaped. Now, there's a bunch of ways you could achieve this. You could just increase the geometry uh, complexity. You could increase the number of triangles and break it down into smaller and smaller steps. So let's let's try that. So in sphere, get plane. Let's uh, let's give it a radius of again keep the same radius but we'll increase the divisions in the latitude to I don't know like let's say 36 and then in the longitude 
then it'll be 72. Save that. And if we run it, now we should get a nicer, rounder sphere. Yeah, see, look, it's starting to get, it looks a lot rounder, a lot less blockier. You still got, you still can see the, uh, the faces, the facets. It's still very flat shaded, but it's starting to look round. And you could keep going. You could in keep increasing the tessellation, the complexity of the mesh, until it was basically perfectly smooth. But that is a lot of geometry, a lot of triangles to render. There must be a better way. All right, so let's say you've got some, you know, sphere. You got your perfect idealized sphere. But in real life, your geometry is going to be, you know, triangles. They're going to be flat. They're going to be pointy. Uh, I'm drawing this diagram in two dimensions, but it's the same idea for three dimensions. Uh, now, what we've been doing up until now is we take the faces of the triangles. Those are the normals. We, uh, we do some vector bullshit with the direction of the light, and that allows us to determine the color shading of that triangle. Now let's take a different approach. Let's say this mesh here, which is an approximation of the ideal triangle, at these vertices we are going to store some, uh, some normals that were derived from the ideal, uh, the ideal shape, the ideal geometry. So at this point on the sphere or on the circle, the normal is here. Even though a vertex is a point in space, it can't have a normal. Uh, if we were to take the normal of the, the ideal shape, it would be like this. So let's take those ideal normals, store them at the vertices of the approximation. Now, we can use these normals and get the color at this point on the ideal shape by doing the normal procedure, dot product between the direction of light and the uh, the normal and that would get us the colors at these points and they would be the the exact colors of the ideal sphere that's great what do we do for all the points in between all the points along this triangle well if you notice something about smooth shading you'll notice that it's a smooth gradient from one part of the geometry to another. It's a kind of blending. It's a kind of interpolation. So what we can do is we can simulate that between these two points here. We can calculate the color at this point, calculate the color at this point, and for all the points in between, we just interpolate between those two, and we'll get a smooth gradient across the surface. It's not going to be the exact color at every point, but it's going to be a good approximation. So we calculate our light at vertices, and then we blend it, we interpolate it across, uh, basically with our pixel, pixel shader, with our triangle rasterization. Now the good news is we've already done all the stuff needed for this. Uh, when we did flat shading, we started by storing the normals in the vertices, and then later on we moved on to the geometry shader. So we've already done vertex lighting, and we've already done blending between vertex colors that was pretty early on in when I showed you pixel shaders. So we just gotta meld those two ideas together. Now the other thing is, we need to store normal data in our vertices. So we need to generate that with our, um, our whatchamacallit, our procedural generation code uh, for spheres. But it's actually incredibly simple, because think about it. For any point on the sphere, the, uh, the position vertex, or the position vector, is going to be the same direction as the normal vector, right? Any, any position vector, any uh, geometry position vector for a vertex is the same as the normal vector. So all you got to do is take the geometry position vector, normalize that, and you've got the normal. Super simple. And in fact, here in Sphere, we've got another function called normals. And all it does is it calls get plane, gets a plane triangle, and then for every vertex, it just sets the normal equal to the normalized position of the vertex. And there you go. You've got your get plane normals. Now let's take a look at uh, Gurud shading that mother. 
All right, so the Gouraud shading effect is very similar, like I said, to the vertex flat effect, except uh, instead of having a single color that is uh, going across the entire triangle, we are going to be blending. So before with the vertex flat effect, we could just assume that all the colors were the same and we didn't have to uh, perform any kind of uh, interpolation. We just took the color directly. But for this one, we're going to have to store the color as a floating vertex or a floating vector and then interpolate that across the face of the triangle and then convert that floating point color into a integer color. One thing I noticed in the vertex flat effect, just a little bit of uh, dumb shit for copy and paste, was that I, for the vertex data type, the input vertex, I made it so that the normal uh, would be part of interpolation, but you don't interpolate normals. That's not something you do, well, not, not right now anyways. Uh, so I removed that from here. But anyways, that's not important. What is important is that we create a new effect called the Gouraud effect and it is going to have a vertex type that stores position and stores a normal and position can you know take part in these kind of operations here you know you define the operations now the vertex shader is going to have an output type that stores a VEC3 for color and a VEC3 position. Remember, color, we got to make this a VEC3 because it's got to be interpolated uh, across the triangle when we're doing the blending. So we make it a VEC3. Each of those components, X, Y, Z, corresponds to red, green, blue. And then we convert it back to integers in the pixel shader. And both of these have to be interpolated, so they both have to have the operations implemented. And then down here, it's just your basic, uh, your basic color calculation, right? You've got your diffuse, which is your dot product between your rotated normal and the direction of light. And you're, you're going to clamp that and you multiply it by the diffuse uh, color. Yeah, that's a color right there. That's your diffuse. And then, uh, what is this again? Now you add the diffuse and the ambient color vectors. You multiply across with the color of the, uh, the object, the material color. You, you saturate that, you make sure it's within the range of zero to one, and then you multiply by 255. And then there you go. And then you just output your position vector times the rotation plus the translation. And you output the color that you calculated, and there you go. You've got all your functions here to manipulate the uh, the light and the material. And that's it. Default geometry shader doesn't do anything special. And all of the actual blending happens in the operations for your uh, for your vertex type, output type. And then here, all you got to do is convert from this VEC3 into an integer color type. And you return that into pixel shader. And there's Bob's your uncle. You've got freaking Gouraud bullshits. The scene is very simple. It just uses the Gouraud shader. It uses, uh, I think you can pass in any kind of um, any kind of mesh you want. And it will apply the Gouraud effect to that. You can do your rotations of the light and the model. It's all the same. And in game.cpp, we add our Gouraud scene with get plane normals for the sphere. And here's the uh, the final effect. And as you can see, it looks pretty gosh darned sexy. If I do say so myself, it's a, it's a very smooth effect. Uh, now, one thing that you're going to notice here, or that you might notice, and you might have noticed this, you know, just from playing games in general, but although the face of it looks very smooth, if you look at the edges, you can see the actual underlying geometry, and you can see the, yeah, the underlying chunkiness of the geometry. So the shader effect on the face, it will make things look very smooth, but it can't hide the silhouette and the, uh, the blockiness of the silhouette. The other thing you might notice is you can still sort of see some, like, some banding here. You can see some artifacts. Because like I said before, it's not, it's not a perfect representation. It's an approximation of the color gradient by linear interpolation. So that Gouraud shading is great for things like spheres, but now what if you want to render something like a cube? 
uh, and you're using a gurad shading effect. It's a cube. It's part of a bigger model, maybe, that has round stuff on it. Well, if you do it the naive way of sharing all your vertices, you're going to have to store your normals. So what normals do you give these vertices? If you give the normals pointing in this direction, like this, this face is going to be nice and flat. But then, what do you do? You put your normals here, now this guy is going to be interpolating between here and here. You're going to get a smooth gradient. It's going to look it's going to look rounded instead of looking uh, flat like this. That's no good. But if you put these guys up here, now you fuck this guy over. See the problem? You can't share the vertices. You've got to make these faces independent, like I shown you in previous uh, previous videos. So if you're using glue rod shading and you want to do something that has hard, you're going to have to make those hard faces. Uh, the vertices of them independent from each other to get that uh, to get that hard cutoff instead of a smooth gradient. So that's one issue to be aware of. Now another issue is how you generate your normals. For something like a uh, procedurally generated sphere, it's trivial, right? Trivial to generate these normals. But what if you have something like a low polygon model? So maybe you generate a model of a face like this. It's very high quality. It has a high polygon count, or it has um, you know like mathematical curves that define it. Uh, and from that, you generate a low polygon model. And let's say you've only got the, the low polygon model. You've only got the positions of the vertices. How do you go? How do you derive the uh, the surface normals? so that you can smooth shade it and get something that looks more like this. And the answer is, you can't really do it perfectly, because when you go from this high model to this low, you lose information. And you can kind of fake it by, you know, taking the face normals and averaging them, or something like that. But it, it won't be perfect. So in general, what you do is when you are generating the low poly model, you also generate the normals from the high poly, and then you've got good normals to work with. And in a modeling software, you can often tweak the normals afterwards. You can drag them around, and that changes the way the shading works on your geometry. But uh, in general, you're not going to get a perfect effect if you try to take a model that doesn't have normal informations and you know, procedurally add normal information afterwards. It's possible, but uh, it might not look as good as you would hope. Now, Sphere is a nice piece of geometry to test our smooth shading, but I also wanted to test it with something a little more interesting. So, I uh, implemented loading models with normal data so that we can uh, load a model that has the normal data set up for it and get a nice, uh, smooth shaded, interesting model. So we're going to be using tiny OBJ and it's terrible and I hate it. Um, but it's what I started with and I don't want to change midway through. Anyways, if we look at our models here, we've got bunny.obj and we've got Suzanne. And Suzanne, Suzanne, like you like you normally uh, used to, you've got your vertices, your list of vertices, and this is a fairly detailed model so it's going to have a lot of vertices. Yeah, there we go. And then you've got another list here of vertex normals. And you'll notice these guys, uh, one thing that's uh, pretty prominent from them is they're all normalized. You're not going to see any guys that have uh, a length that's not one, basically. Uh, so you've got your vertex normals. And then after that, you've got your faces. And the faces, they specify, you know, three vertices that um, form the triangle. And they specify the index into the position uh, vector and the index into the normal vector, so they're independent of each other, and they're indexed independently. And tiny OBJ makes it hard to get that information out, but you'll see that in a second. So how do we do this? Well, <clears throat> we got to figure out how to get that normal information out of tiny OBJ and into our vertices. So we go on the index triangle list.h, and I've added another function in here, load normals, which loads the mesh with normals. Uh, give it a file name. It's very similar to what we had before here, with just the uh, loading. Yeah, here we'll just load. So here we're uh, loading the vertices, and here indices normals. Okay, so so when we whenever we uh, basically whenever we're putting our indices into the index buffer. We're also going to update the normals for all the affected vertices. So I load the index struct 
from mesh indices indexed at the you know the correct indexing position and this is normal like before i then store the uh the index into my own vector idx.vertex index but it also has idx.normal index and there are three of those and that corresponds to the three components of the normal it's it's bullshit it's fucked this is really garbage interface but i will index into my vertices at the vertex index and I'm going to update its normal whenever I do an index. So sometimes some normals will be updated twice or three times. Uh, but it doesn't matter. I don't, I'm not going to worry about that. This is the easiest way I could think of doing it. And that gets that information together. Because basically the way objects work are the indices and the positions. The vertex positions and the vertex normals are stored separately. But in our system, we're storing them together. So we've got to get them together. And this is how we do it. And then the rest is the same. So this is bullshit. I don't recommend it. If you were going to be starting your own from scratch and you wanted a good library, I haven't actually tried it out myself, so I can't say for sure. But this one looks really nice and easy to use. OBJ Loader. Interface is super simple. You create the loader. You load the file. And then you've got access to all the meshes and for each mesh you can just index into a vertex and get its position and get the component with the dot notation you don't have to do this bullshit uh freaking indexing math to get at your freaking uh, it makes me mad why did i ever pick this terrible terrible library anyways so that is loading and if we run this we see we've got a beautiful a beautiful baby girl look at this lovely Lovely Suzanne. And yeah, works works great. Smooth shading. Loaded our loaded our mesh. You can use this to load pretty much any mesh from object file. And if it's got normals, it's gonna work. It's gonna be sweet. So that's gonna about do it for this video. Um I uh, recommend you to you know play with these things, play with the procedural generation, uh explore it your own. Definitely uh, play around with the uh, Gurud shading code because it's something that is very important to know about. It's the basis of uh, sh a lot of shading uh, techniques. And uh, if you want a little challenge, I got one for you. Try to procedurally um, reconstruct the normals for these vertices and do a smooth shading of the bunny. Uh, see what you can do. I, have, I imagine you can do a pretty good job uh, with a simple algorithm to reconstruct those uh, vertex normals. So we'll see, we'll see what you get. There's, I'm not going to do like a homework solution thing for it or anything. Just a little challenge for you if you're interested. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D Fundamentals. Mm -hmm.